Hey guys, your boy Chill here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D 1256. In the last video, we ended by discussing the theory of slope scale depth biasing. Now we're going to look at how that's implemented efficiently by dedicated hardware using Direct 3D. If you need a refresher on the theory of the slope scaled stuff, you can head back to tutorial 55 and watch the last few minutes. Then we're going to spend some time developing a sandbox that will allow us to mix and match all the different shadow mapping settings and techniques that we've covered so far and allow us to do this at runtime. So this is going to give us a powerful tool to study and compare the effects of all the different settings and their combinations. Finally, I'm briefly going to talk about some techniques and ideas that didn't make the cut for this arc, but that I think you should be at least aware of. So first things first, where in the pipeline does the new slope scaled depth biasing happen? Well, it actually happens here. We're going to create a, it's in the rasterizer state that we can add these depth biasing parameters. And it's not super complicated. Uh, so we're going to create a shadow rasterizer. We just create a default rasterizer descriptor like we've done many times before. But we're going to set some extra parameters. We're going to set the depth bias, the slope scale depth bias, and depth bias clamp. And these three things will allow us to basically add depth bias. So when we render the geometry, the depth that is written to the buffer will be biased by a little bit. And it'll be pushed backwards or further away based on these three values. So what do they mean? Well, first one here, depth bias. This one is a constant depth bias that will be applied to every pixel rendered. So this is like the depth bias that we've been doing. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, slope. It's just a base level of biasing that we're going to apply to every pixel. Then we have the slope scale depth bias. This is the amount of bias that will be uh, multiplied by the level of slope and then added to this depth bias. So this determines how strong the bias increases with increasing slope. Final one here, depth bias clamp, is saying, okay, bias the depth, but if you get a crazy slope, because the slope can get so crazy that it's almost like, you know, dividing by zero or multiplying by infinity. So if it gets really crazy, don't ever exceed this amount of bias. There's a clamp that you want to put that on, put on that. And that's just so that if you get extreme slopes, you're not going to get some kind of weird, funky values. And then when we render our shadow map, they will be pre-biased, those values, and the pre-biasing will be dynamic depending on the depth. It's going to be a good thing. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I could show you this code, or I could show you how this works, how it looks, but there, there are some other commits in here that I kind of glossed over, and those commits have to do with, I want to be able to dynamically control the parameters of the shader. So I want to be able to control the amount of PCF samples that we take, whether or not we're using hardware PCF, what kind of filtering, whether it's um, point filtering or bilinear, uh, and I want to be able to control the level of biasing. So the constant bias and the slope scale depth bias and the, uh, the clamp. And I want to be able to control them all with a user interface at runtime so I can see what changing all the different parameters means. I don't want to have to close the program, change some values in the shader, recompile, run it again. That's not good. I want to see the changes in front of my eyes as I play with sliders. So to, in order to do that, I had to do a bunch of freaking shader coding. It wasn't super easy, but um, it was worth it. It was definitely worth it for, the, uh, for what it gives us. Uh, the first thing I did, I just want to control the level of PCF and the depth bias. So the PCF level is basically PCF range. Uh, that was a compile time constant. Now I want to make that a runtime constant. Only if you do that, it's going to cause problems because then you can't unroll the loop, right? Because if the range isn't a constant at compile time, the compiler won't be able to unroll these loops. It doesn't know how far you should go, right? So I had to turn this runtime value into a compile time value. So what I did was I put another loop here and I loop from basically the minimum possible level I want 
to the maximum possible level. So I, I basically said, okay, level will never be greater than four. So we're going to loop from zero to four, and we're going to call shadow loop with each of these levels. So we're going to unroll this loop. We're gonna basically going to call shadow loop in our code five times. But we also have this if statement that compares with the value that is in from this constant buffer. Remember, this is a, it's a constant buffer, but it's only constant with respect to a draw call. It's not constant when we compile the shader. It's not known. So this runtime value will control which one of these invocations actually gets called and into the shadow level. So we have to do this because, you know, range needs to be a compile time value, but this one is a runtime value. So we're actually generating code that calls shadow loop five times, but each one of those calls is within a branch. So only one will actually be executed. And that's the one that corresponds to the PCF level passed in from our constant buffer. So then, you know, you just got your standard stuff, right? Um, blur outline render graph is going to have windows. Right before it was render widgets, now it's render windows. And there's two windows. There's a kernel window that controls the blur kernel, and then the shadow window that controls the shadowing effect. And you know, for the shadow window, obviously you're gonna have you know sliders to control the PCF level and the depth bias. And here we're gonna have to set up a control buffer for the shadow. We just do our dynamic constant buffer, PCF level, depth bias, set those up default values create them, wire that stuff into our system, wire it all up, and it works. We can control that stuff. I ran into some issues though, because the next thing I wanted to do here is now I don't just want to control the PCF uh, level and the bias, I also want to control whether or not we're using hardware PCF. So to do that, now we have two sampler states. We have the normal sampler state and we have the sampler comparison state and only one of them will actually be active. So now depending on whether we're using hardware PCF or not, we're going to be, you know, doing sample compare or we're going to be doing sample. There's one more setting in here, whether or not we're using bilinear filtering, but that's not passed in uh, as in the constant buffer. That's only a setting that we set in the sampler that we're going to using. So that's not actually exposed to the shader. The shader doesn't know about this setting, but it is used when creating the sampler, shadow sampler. So now we have a whole bunch of different stuff for a shadow sampler. We can set hardware PCF. Uh, we can set whether it's bilinear or not. Problem with this, we can't just have one shadow sampler, like one actual sampler state or something, and just set it to where it's either um, comparison sampler or normal sampler. So we actually create four sampler states for each of the permutations. You can have uh, point sampling or bilinear, and then you can have hardware PCF uh, comparison or just normal sampler. So you have those two options. All the permutations or combinations gives you four, four options, right? And in here, so we create the four different samplers based on you know the different parameters. There's a little bit of trickiness I do here. I encode... I basically encode whether it's bilinear or whether it's hardware PCF comparison. I encode that binary in a two-bit binary number, and then I use bit stuff to extract out which one is which, basically. So I got this function make sampler takes in uh, what does it take in here? Some booleans, yeah, for whether it's going to create a sampler that has bilinear filtering, whether it has hardware PCF comparison. And based on that information is going to set these different descriptor parameters and then create a boy. And we're going to get four boys, and then those four boys are stored in this array, and which one is actually bound to the pipeline depends on this index, current sampler. And this index is determined by that bit arithmetic based on whether we're setting bilinear to true, and whether we're setting hardware PCF to true. That's how it works. And so depending on those settings, what's set into this bindable, that determines which one of these states will be bound to the pipeline. And that's all good, except you're gonna get you're gonna get errors. 
or warnings thrown by DXGI. And the reason why is because it expects two samplers to be bound, but depending on how your setting starts, when you first run the program, only one of these guys is going to be bound, whichever one was set to be bound at the very beginning. Uh, so it's going to throw a warning, and we don't want that. So it's a very simple fix. When we create the shadow sampler, we actually... Uh, it's a dirty little workaround, but we just we bind hardware PCF uh, and normal filtering guy. We bind them both to the pipeline to start off with, just to make sure that something is bound to each of those slots. That way, when we do our dr first draw call, it's not going to fail because one of them was unbound. It's not going to throw a DXGI warning at us. And here we do a little bit of fixing up the shadow sampler. We make it bound in from outside of the Lambertian pass before it was embedded in the Lambertian pass. Now it's going to be bound in from outside, created here, added as a global source, and then linked in here. That was shadow sampler control sort of working. Here is shadow sampler control actually working. So you can see here my bit logic was missing a uh, bitwise not slot. Ah, 0.25 or zero, that should be one or zero for this thing here, because we're dividing by total number of samples taken. We don't want to pre-divide here. So this now has, this commit here now has shadowing with a lot of dynamic controls in. And let's just take a look at what that is, because that's going to give us some insights. All right, so here we go. We've got our PCF level. We've got our depth bias. Hardware PCF bilinear. Very nice. So. Coming in here, we got hardware PCF and bilinear filtering. So we should expect some pretty smooth, but we can still see the pixels. And yeah, smooth on the edges, but the pixels are still quite uh, apparent. What if we turn hardware PCF off? Now the pixels, super hard, right? These are the super hard shadows that we're used to. What happens if we play around with the depth biasing a little bit? Well, let's try it out. Let's turn the depth biasing down, down, down. And you can see here, with high depth biasing, we're actually losing shadows in this foliage here. We turn it down, we're getting more shadows in places like this. Down, 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 and yeah. We go down to zero, and we hit very nastiness here. Interesting. Here is the shadow acne. So obviously depth bias of zero is no good. But even with a very small depth bias, 0 0.00001, the floor is still good. That's interesting, right? Because we should have our um, our slope scale error. Only we don't have our slope scale error. And the reason for that is because we have bilinear filtering turned on. So this is something that I wanted to touch at later on. Remember at the beginning I said, you know, I posed the question, why do we have these hard shadows here if we have bilinear filtering turned on? What is this doing? Well, it's not helping us with our pixelation of our shadow. Turn it off, turn it on. You can see that the shadows, they, um, they re recede, they come in. But turning bilinear filtering on helps with shadow acne. So let's take a look again at this floor scene and let's turn bilinear filtering off. Boom, we get huge shadow acne all of a sudden. Pretty pictures. Why is that? Well, it all comes back to this thing here, right? The, um, the, uh, the slope mediated depth air. One of the big problems with slope media depth air is you're going to be, from your view position, you're going to be sampling at points that are different than the points sampled for the depth buffer. And so your comparison, you're going to have an error of this much. But what if when you sampled this texture, a shadow map, what if instead of just, you know, taking the point, the closest sample and saying that's the one we're going to compare with, what if we took this one and this one and blended them. Then we're going to get some depth that is in between this depth and this depth. Maybe we'll get a depth like this, which is actually the depth of the surface. And now, all of a sudden, our calculations work very nicely. We don't even have to add very much depth biasing at all. That's the beauty. So if you have bilinear filtering on, your error, your quantization error, your sampling error, from your shadow map gets reduced for the slope because you're going to be blending those depth values between the two closest samples. But you turn that off, all of a sudden, you need a lot of depth bias to 
compensate for your depth error. But with bilinear filtering on, you can take that depth bias way down and you're still good, you're still Gucci. So that's the interesting thing about bilinear filtering uh, with this stuff. It doesn't make your shadow edges any prettier, but it does give you a huge advantage in your slope mediated depth bias, or your slope mediated depth error. Now another thing that's interesting here, turn on hardware PCF. Without bilinear filtering turned on, hardware PCF seems to do nothing. And that makes, that sort of makes sense, because remember, hardware PCF only works when you take those four, when you sample those four texels, and then you perform the comparison. And you're only going to pull in those four texels if you're doing bilinear filtering. So you turn that on, and now you get the blur. Alright, that's a cool story. Now here's an interesting little thing. You turn on hardware PCF, all of a sudden, you're getting shadow acne on your floor. Why is that? Well, that's the interesting thing, right? When we're doing bilinear filtering with hardware PCF off, what are we doing? We are blending between the depths and then doing our test on the blended values, which are going to be accurate depths because they've been blended between the nearest uh, samples. What happens when we turn hardware PCF on? We're not testing blended depths. We're sampling four depths, testing, and then blending the results. So the test that we're performing is on samples that have not been blended, so there is going to be some error for the offset. So if you have hardware PCF on, you're not going to get the super accurate uh, texture blending, blending that you like. It's a one or the other. Turn on hardware PCF and you get smoother edges, very nice looking shadows, but you're going to have to turn up your bias if you want shit to work. Now, turn up the PCF level, your samples are now going even further away from the actual position. Further samples means more error, means you got to turn up that depth bias to compensate. Turning up that depth bias, crank that soldier boy, and you're going to have problems. Look at our shadow here. We're starting to lose pieces of our shadow. What happens? Turn the PCF up even more. Level 4. Level 4 PCF, well, it seems okay here. Let's move the light down a little bit. Okay, we're getting self-shadowing here. No good. Turn the PCF down. Self-shadowing is less. No more self-shadowing. So, PCF high level, going to give us problems with a low light. How do we solve that? Well, all we got to do, my friend, turn up the depth bias. You turn that shit up, all of a sudden, you lose this. You, this thing has no shadow anymore. That's just a Peter Panning gone crazy. But you fixed your self-shadowing on the floor. Hmm. That's not good, right? So if we want more PCF, we're going to be taking more samples further away from the center. That's going to increase our error. We're going to have to turn up our depth bias. That is going to give us shadowing artifacts. So you have one or the other. You can either turn down the PCF level, uh, in which case you can get your nice shadows back here, but you're going to have not as smooth edges, which makes a difference, especially if you were to project something much further away than this wall. Or what's the other solution? Well, the other solution is we do slope scale depth biasing. Now we can add more bias for the floor, which needs it, but for the stuff that doesn't need it, less bias and we get less artifacts. So I showed you the uh, slope scale depth biasing rasterizer states. Now we're going to make that controllable with our shadow rasterizer. I already implemented the functions to be able to change the, uh, the depth bias, the slope bias and the clamp. So we add the controls for that. So with this, now we can control the slope scaled depth biasing parameters. And this is the final form of our dynamic shadowing technique here. And this is what I created, and I created this for my own purposes, so I could learn more about this stuff, teach it to you guys, and also because it would be useful in a video to demonstrate, but mainly because now you guys have this, and you can play around with all these different parameters on the shadow effect and see how they affect things. You get a, uh, get a kind of intuition about how all these things work by playing around with it in real time. So here's our settings. Here's the bias that is applied 
um, using the rasterizer settings, here's the bias that's applied in the shader. So let's turn this off. Uh, now we're only using the bias applied in the rasterizer. Now, what interesting thing is the, the bias, the constant bias is actually an integer value. And I believe it is the number of the smallest uh, floating point steps available. It's kind of weird because floating point numbers are weird, but it actually doesn't matter what these numbers are as long as you tweak them to make your scene work properly. So let's take a look at here. All right, we got our stuff here. We got a hardware PCF bilinear filtering on. We want that, obviously. Uh, let's take our pre-bias. Let's take our slow bias off. We don't need any of that yet. So now we have no slow bias. All we have is the constant bias from this 10,000 value. And what we're going to do is we're going to mm, turn this down to a very small amount until we see some like artifacts on this wall here. That's because the wall here is facing basically towards, directly towards the light. There's no slope involved. Like, I think we could probably, if I do control, let's put like 40. Let's do 80. I mean, 40 seems like 20. Now, 20 is too few because we're already getting stuff on the wall itself. That's too few. 40 seems like it's enough. So this is enough biasing to basically counter floating point error. So that is our constant biasing. Now that does nothing for the slope stuff. So now we have to add biasing to counter our slope error. So we do that with the slope bias. We just add a little bit here. Keep adding it. Keep going. Ah, we're losing it. It's going and it's gone. So now we fix the slope error with the minimum amount of slope bias necessary. And we've also added a little bit of pre-bias there to handle the wall. And this is looking fine. Now, let's turn up our PCF level. Level one, level two. Look at our floor, and this is back right now. We need more slope-based tolerance. So we just turn this up until it goes away. So now we have a slope bias of four. Remember, this bias being applied based on the slope. So there's very little bias being applied to things like the wall here. Very little being applied to this. So we don't get any artifacts. We can crank up the bias for the floor without affecting stuff like this. I can crank up the PCF level to four. Let's go back here. Let's take a look at our self-shadowing. It doesn't, ah, we're still getting, yeah, we can get, we're getting self-shadowing here, but just at least a little bit. Now we've lost it. Where is it? Yeah, okay. So we've countered the self-shadowing on the floor, but we still have very nice shadowing here, even at PCF level four. This is the best of both worlds that you can get if you do slope-scaled depth biasing. You add a tiny little bit of constant bias, Remember, this isn't 40 units of depth. This is 40 float quanta, basically. 40, the smallest step you can make in a floating point number, 40 of those. Very tiny amount to counter floating point error. Then an amount that's dependent on the amount of slope. So we're scaling the slope of the geometry. And for PCF level four, we need to scale it by six. And then we can set this clamp just to, uh, to make sure that we super crazy slopes don't mess us up. If you put it too low, you're going to mess yourself up with the bias. You're going to lose your biasing. But, but yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful setup we got here. Slope scale depth bias. It's all handled by fixed function in the rasterizer. So it's very fast. It gives you the best of both worlds. You'll love to see it. You freaking love to see it. Although a PCF level of four is probably too many. That's 81 samples taken for every pixel drawn of the shadow map. So it's probably too much. You probably crank that down to like three or even two. You get better performance. You can turn down your slope scale depth bias a little bit. It's all good. Quick demonstration here to highlight something important. Uh, so we got PCF level three. We got slope scale biasing off. Lots of self shadowing, obviously. We're gonna turn up our bias in the pixel shader until we lose the self shadowing. So I think that's right about here, huh? Yeah, it seems like it's good here. And let's just make sure. Yeah, it looks okay. Okay. Then, what do we do? Let's try now move the light down a little bit. And immediately, almost immediately, we get self-shadowing again. Right? 
So you make an adjustment at one point, then you move the light a little bit, and all of a sudden your adjustment that you made, it's not, uh, it's not valid anymore. Now let's try the same thing with slope scale bias. So we turn down the pixel shader bias to zero. We're gonna add some, just a tiny bit of pre-bias, and we're gonna turn up our slope bias until we lose the self shadows on the floor. So we're right about here, I think. Now we're gonna move our light down. And you see, we go down low, we dip it low, and there's no, there's no self shouting. Once you have calibrated, you can move this light all around and it is gonna give you good results. Take a look at our filtered shadows here. We're doing three by three sampling grid with hardware PCF enabled. Uh, and when we turn off hardware PCF, we see, yeah, that's super pixelated. There's only a few light levels possible here. Uh, what if, you might say, well, okay, that's, P hardware PCF seems to be doing good work here. But what if we turn up our sampling? Does hardware PCF still, is it still relevant? Well, let's turn it up to five by five. Now I can, I can still see the gradations in there. I can still see the discrete levels of light. 7x7, seven seven, it's starting to look better, but I can still see it if I, if I zoom in here. So you see here that um, hardware PCF is still relevant even with relatively large sampling kernels. Look at that, so smooth blended, very nice. And that's it. Now, the further you increase your PCF level, the more you have to increase your slope bias, and if you do that too much, your slope bias is going to go up so much that it's going to start messing you up. You're still going you're start going to get Peter Panning again, and it's not going to be a good time. For that case, if you want a really huge PCF kernel, what you actually have to do is instead of like, you know, taking your view pixel depth here and comparing it with a sample from like over here with this huge error, instead of doing that, you actually, this is your view pixel, you actually calculate the depths for the actual depths at every sampling position and compare that with the sample depth. You have to uh, derive out the real geometric depths at all of your different sampling intervals. And I'm not going to go into that because we're doing fine without it. Um, but it does require some advanced shader things. You have to use the derivatives and you have to use the chain rule. So it's an advanced technique. I'm not going to go into it. But if you're interested, here is a link to a PDF. Look on this page here, I think it's, it doesn't say, it doesn't label the page. Page 36, there you go. Talking about receiver plane depth bias, if the PCF kernel is large enough, using a single depth comparison value across kernel is insufficient. That's what I was just talking about. In order to approximate the per tap receiver depth, we need to know how much the depth changes with respect to the shadow map texture coordinates. It's not easy to do, but you can do it with, apparently with a variant on the chain rule. And you're gonna take the Jacobian of some derivatives, and you can use that to calculate the uh, the actual depth at the receiver. So here you can see with an 8x8 PCF filter, without the adjustment, lots of shadow acne here, with the adjustment, looking much better. And here is the code for an implementation of that. But I'm not going to go over it because it's, I mean, this video, I'm, I'm looking at my clock here, it's 2 hours and 50 minutes. I, gotta, I have to split it up as it is, and I haven't coded it up yet, so... We don't need it, we don't need it right now, but I just wanted to tell you that that exists. Another thing that exists is a trick that you can do where when you're rendering your shadow map, you, um, you render the, you don't render the front facing geometry, you render the backs of the geometries. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that, there's actually lots of stuff on the internet about it. But by rendering the backs of geometries, um, you can overcome a lot of self-shadowing issues without having to add a big shadow bias. But that solution doesn't work for things like thin geometry, which things like your floor is going to be thin geometry. Uh, and so it's not really, it's not a very general solution. It's kind of like a hack. So I didn't bother doing it. But in certain situations, it can give you good results and you, you have to do less work to get at those results. But there you have it, PCF and slope scale depth biasing. All, I hope you've learned a lot throughout this, probably two videos maybe, I'm gonna have to split this up. Hope you learned, learned a lot about that stuff, learned about how, you know, shadow sampling is done, how that relates 
to the uh, the shadow test what we can do in the hardware to perform that test using the hardware getting smoother edges on the shadows you learned a little bit about the theory behind soft shadows slope mediated depth air just so many things you learned and i uh, hope it was a good time for you my throat is now very sore been recording for you know three hours straight with all the different takes some some breaks taken in between but uh chili is a tired boy so we are gonna cut it off here we've got our shadow working oh i almost forgot there's one last commit here and it's not something it's not a big deal i just remove all of the dynamic shadowing stuff so i create a shader p shadow static and this one has that constant buffer removed it's just a fixed function static you can't control the depth biasing or any of that stuff um, because in a real game engine you're not going to do that so i decided to make a version that was static and then I made another version that's dynamic. So I can actually, the, the P shadow include is just set to include one of those and then all of the other shaders include this one. So by changing one line of code here, I can switch between static shadow effect and the dynamic controllable one. But for the most part, we're gonna stick with the, shadow, the static one. So I just make that change going forward in the future. So if you want to play around with those depth settings, and I recommend you do, play around with those sliders and learn on your own, learn some intuition about what all the different settings affect, how they can affect a scene, um, you definitely want to check out this commit, because in this commit, all that shit's going to be gone. And yeah, definitely check this stuff out for yourself, play with it, understand it, learn it. Dynamic shadows are, you know, an essential feature for any engine in this day and age. And you should understand how they work. Even if you're not building your own game engine, even if you're using Unity or UE4, you really have no excuse to not understand how this stuff works. In the next video, we're going to do a little bit of a context switch. We're going to do something that seemingly is completely different from shadowing, but that actually ties in. And that is we're going to be implementing a skybox for our scene. So we're going to be looking at cube textures, how to sample them, how to work with them and that's actually going to tie back nicely into what we're doing in our, with our shadows here uh, but that's next video until then thanks for watching hope you enjoyed this video if you did please click the like button it helps a lot and i will see you soon with some more hardware 3d